I was just going through some of our older classes, and for anybody who wants to know what it's like to be in paragliding training, I thought I'd share this one with you. Not every subject in our curriculum is so complex, but I want my students to have a thorough understanding of why the weather plays out in our region the way that it does. If you're learning how to fly and you want to see more content like this, I encourage you to go to our website and join our weekly online classes. For now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Ah, uh, dust devil season. So I talk about this a lot because it is a particular risk at our site. And um, there's a lot of days, especially as we come into the summertime, that it's going to be particularly risky to be connected to a glider anywhere on the land, right? Even at the launch, at the uh, LZ, kiting area, any of that stuff. And the reason I talk about this and bring it up all the time is because there's always pilots, even experienced pilots, who are thinking, um, I'm going to get there early and you know get a jump on things and, and get out there and do some kiting in the uh, middle of the afternoon before the class starts or whatever. And even you may see other people doing that. You know, sometimes you'll see other pilots that are out there kiting. You know, it's about two thirty in the afternoon on a summer day. That doesn't mean it's perfectly safe. And it's, uh, in my mind, it's kind of like, you know, you could get away with not wearing your seatbelt a lot, right? I mean, there's plenty of times that you could do that, but it's the time where you needed it and you didn't have it on that really can screw you over. And so that is kind of um, how I look at the dust devil thing. You could probably avoid most of them, right? And um, you maybe could see it coming or hear other people screaming, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is. But uh, if, uh, if you're unlucky, if you're one of those unlucky ones, then you have little choice in the matter past a certain point. You just become part of the dust devil. So tonight we'll talk about how to identify those conditions and um, the variables that, that could potentially lead up to dust devils. And uh, later on tonight, we'll talk about rule number one, which is kind of a segue from, you know, this as well. You know, it's, um, it's part of it, rule number one, whatever that is. Okay, so um, first we'll talk about terms, and then we'll have a look at the skew T charts. And in doing so, we'll try to put a little more definition, understanding behind that um, graph so that we can make better use of it in the future. And then we'll talk about some practical precautions, some you know, things that we can do and consider to avoid becoming part of a dust double. So for terms, uh, here is a um, you know chart uh, or a, a picture right that shows relative humidity throughout the year for the continental U.S. And you can see in the desert southwest that you know it gets pretty dry. That's one of those things. I mean, if you're on the coast, it's still uh, pretty humid. And, you know, the effect of the humidity just in general for us as paraglider pilots, uh, it tends to soften the air. That's one of the effects that we notice in a paraglider. If it's very, very arid and dry, then things get a little more jumpy. Um, there's a, a lot more action in the air, especially when we're talking in terms of convection. And um, when we add humidity to the equation, all of that just kind of uh, gets softer, right? With the edges of thermals get easier to transition between the layers. And, um, you know, the thermals aren't so tight in the cores. Now, a lot of this is due to where the air comes from when it's in this region. Um, and think about this, you know, it's not just in the horizontal sense, but in the vertical. We tend to be in a high pressure latitude on the planet. So we're constantly getting this air being forced down on top of us from the Hadley uh, cells. And, you know, so um, when we have a dry surface, that essentially means there's no shortwave energy going into evaporation. Um, and so it's, 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 it's actually, um, you know, when you have moisture in the air, then it's absorbing some of that radiant heat. And, um, you know, that has the effect of kind of homogenizing the air mass. But when we have temperature differentials that are on the extreme, 
that's where we get a lot more action when we're talking about convection and instability. So if I were to have a very um, you know warm lower layer and then a cooler, I'm not saying cold, right? I'm saying a cooler layer above it, then that is what promotes um, you know a lot of uh, rigorous thermic action, right? A lot of instability. Um, so one of the things to consider here is then the, the term intense solar heating at the surface. And you'll hear that a lot in reference to dust devils. That's one part of the equation, right? We'll start to add some more definition to it. So this is what we know as dry convection when it happens in our climate. Now, um, that's when convection occurs where there's no saturation of those air parcels that are moving up. That is to say, they don't turn into clouds, they don't precipitate out. And, um, you know, that's a kind of a different day. If you were in the paragliding chats, you might hear like blue sky thermals, right? Um, in other parts of the world where they have clouds that mark the tops of thermals, that's an easy way to identify triggers and where that action is taking place. But in our neck of the woods, we typically do not have as many clouds or cloudy days that are showing you the, the cumulus clouds on top of thermic triggers. And like I said, the reason being is that we typically have high pressure aloft and it's uh, limiting that action. Okay, um, and here's another term. The, we have the adiabatic lapse rate, both of the environmental uh, ambient air, right? We call that the ELR. And we also have the dry lapse rate, which is if you were to lift a parcel through various mechanisms, what would happen to that parcel of air? How would it cool off as it goes up through the atmosphere, reducing pressure along the way? Um, a super adiabatic lapse rate is when you have the environmental lapse rate is much greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. If some of these terms are confusing, maybe it's the first time you've heard them, I do recommend checking out the SKU-T introduction, and it's one of the videos listed in the student section. Um, at any rate, we'll, we'll try to flesh out a few more of these terms, but if you want a more in-depth explanation as to what these terms really are about, then I would suggest starting with that session. Um, okay, so when we have this super adiabatic lapse rate, this is another condition that we would expect dust devils to um, be more probable, right? Is, uh, what does that mean that the environmental lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate? That means it's cooling off at a much larger degree than the parcel lapse rate, okay? So we'll look at it on a chart and, you know, we'll be able to see it by the lines, but the dry adiabatic lapse rate is, you know, 9.8 or, you know, 10 degrees centigrade per uh, kilometer or 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. That's how much we expect the cooling of the parcel to take place just as a, uh, a process of, um, you know, expansion of cooling through expansion. Another component of the equation is that we would have light winds. Um, and what this, what this indicates, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg thing, right? Um, what this indicates is that we have inefficient mixing in, in a deep planetary boundary layer. So the planetary boundary layer is going to be, you can think of it as like the surface layer, the, the layer closest to the earth. And this layer that we live in, right? Um, you know, it has various thickness, depends on whether it's daytime or nighttime, what season, um, the angle of the sun, stuff like that. And it, it, it changes, right? Um, things happen on the surface that will be different than above this planetary boundary layer. And one of the things is that if it's, if it's thick, right, and we'll talk about the various conditions that would lead up to that, um, then the heat can't really mix through that layer very well. And when that happens, when, when the heat can't go through the layer, um, that's where you tend to get the lower layers being much hotter because they're by the surface, right? They're, 
that are what's gathering all the heat from solar radiation. And so you, you, you have this really hot lower layer and it's not allowed to really go anywhere um, and spread out. Now, by contrast, what if you had higher winds, right? What if there was more mixing in that planetary boundary layer? Then you wouldn't have the very, very lowest shallow layer uh, heating up so much, right? The, it would be wicked off. The heat would be wicked off. It would be moved around. It would be mixed up with the rest of that layer. And that creates a different condition, right? Okay. Uh, and we're going to touch on that again, so don't worry if it's sounding a little Greek. Um, the max temperature will be a few degrees warmer than simply the dry adiabatic elapsed rate from the surface. So under these conditions where you have light winds and not very much mixing at the lower layer, your max temperature will be warmer than if you just started from the dry adiabatic elapsed rate from the surface. Now, that is to say that most of the time in our, in our climate, you're going to have a max temperature um, that is going to be significantly higher um, due to clear blue skies and surface heating and the type of terrain that we're on. You know, we don't have vegetation most places, right? It's pretty dry. And uh, so that allows that layer to, to get, you know, pretty hot. Um, that creates a condition at the very lowest boundary or the very lowest layer of the planetary boundary layer that is even more extreme than you would see just from the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So, you know, the lapse rates for these, you know, parcels, that's just talking about the packet of air moving up through the atmosphere, right? But it's not really addressing what's going on at the actual ground layer. And that is a different process. We, we have this term adiabatic lapse rate. What does adiabatic mean? That is a process that does not transfer heat beyond the, the, the boundary of that parcel. So the, the rate of cooling and, and heating, if you move, move it up or down through the atmosphere, that's because of expansion and compression. But there's a diabatic process which does share heat between that parcel and the um, you know, stuff outside of it, across the boundary of that parcel. That's the diabatic process, and that's where the air is coming into contact with the ground, right, or with whatever it's over. So it's not that we could see that process on the skew T chart. We're actually looking at that air after it's lifted off, after it becomes a parcel unto itself and is not actually connected to the ground anymore. So there's a little bit of a difference there of what we can see. Um, if we remember from the skew T session, what these um, you know, lines mean, uh, first of all, down here, the dashed line represents the adiabatic lapse rate. And where we have a super adiabatic condition, that's very, very unstable, right? That would say that the parcel temperature is a lot warmer than the environmental lapse rate. And by contrast, you know, you have the temperature inversion. And this is where you have the parcel temperature is um, cooler than the adiabatic or the environmental lapse rate. And so you don't have any rising of air. That's a stable condition. And that's a pretty extreme slant to the lines, right? We're going to see this on the skew T charts in a second. Um, you know, you have slightly stable conditions and you have neutral, and then you have very unstable conditions here at the top. And you can think of it, they express it like a ball, right? These conditions, um, the unstable condition would be like if you, if you tip that ball in any direction, it would roll off, right? It's going to keep going basically. The neutral condition is uh, it will have some, you know, energy, but it's not going to go very far. And then the stable condition is going to return to stability. And then the inversion is not going anywhere, right? It's, it's capped off. It's basically limited um, by that condition of the environmental lapse rate. Okay. Um, let's look at another way, right? Stronger heating results in more thermals, which push up the planetary boundary layer. Okay. 
We can think about that like a, uh, you know, well, actually I have a little graphic I can show you after this one. Um, but when we have lots of heating, the thermals go higher, they exert more strength, they, they push the, the layer upward. Uh, and remember the thick planetary boundary layer is what's contributing to the onset of the dust devil condition, right? So stronger heat uh, until they reach a, le a level that they can't rise anymore, no more buoyancy or the top of the planetary boundary layer. Now, if you've ever been like on an airplane when you're coming through the planetary boundary layer, this is uh, felt by turbulence, right? You're, you're, you're actually transitioning from one zone to another. And so you're feeling the, you know, the layer of the free atmosphere, uh, a little layer in between there, but then you're having the planetary boundary layer. And this is like where all the boiling is going on with the, uh, you know, if you're thinking about it like a pot of boiling water, right? You're transitioning into that zone where everything is kind of getting chewed up. And that's why you're feeling that turbulence as you're coming in. Um, that's the, that's the top of the PBL, right? And we think about it right here in this little graphic I made. It's you have the solar radiation coming in, hitting the surface. It's very high heat, but then that parcel, as it moves up, it starts to cool off and to a point where it's basically equal temperature and pressure of the surrounding air mass. And so it's not going to be able to go past a certain point. So usually it's pretty defined. You know, you, you would be able to see this most of the time, especially like if you're standing at that altitude or slightly above. And, um, you know, if you're in an airplane or something that's flying, then sometimes you're transitioning between those two layers. Uh, it's much easier to heat up dry air. Um, if you think about it, right, the, the moisture in the air is actually absorbing heat energy. Um, and when we're talking about short wave versus radiant heat, you know, uh, the rough terrain has more turbulent flow. Right, so the terrain features can actually chew up the airflow in the and mostly the horizontal direction, but also a bit in the vertical. So that can contribute to a deeper planetary boundary layer too. So this uh, PBL level might go up and down based on the amount of terrain interference. So we get friction from terrain, and we get you know changes in airflow due to things like mountain ranges and and whatnot. And then evapotranspiration is um, that's basically the moisture coming out of plant material um, that has a cooling effect and it actually decreases the buoyancy. So that, that counteracts the, the effect that we were talking about with everything else. So that is to say that if you don't have any plants, if you don't have any green on the ground, you're much more likely to have a hotter, um, drier PBL. Okay, so what are the conditions that we're flying in, right? It's mostly uh, arid with not very much plant um, vegetation covering the surface. And then, uh, you know, we also have mountains and stuff like that um, that are disturbing the airflow and creating a thicker PBL. So we kind of have the conditions that are ripe for this sort of thing to occur. Um, if you think about this, right, if we have a very thick planetary boundary layer, it's exerting pressure on the lowest layer, right? The part that's uh, spreading out along the surface. So think about this little graphic here. If we were to, you know, have convection taking place, right? The one on the left here, uh, this represents where you have extreme heating of just the surface. And the one on the right is where you have a more uniform heating of the air mass through the PBL. When you have a spread out superheated um, lower layer like this, what happens when you do have convection taking place is it pulls in from further away, right? That, that heated air is being drawn towards the center and it's going to be moving faster and it's going to be um, you know, kind of converging at this core with a lot more energy because it's pulling from a further distance. And you can think about it as like, um, you know, an ice skater pulling in their arms and going really fast, right? That, that speed increase 
when in their rotation, it's kind of the same thing, right? If it's not pulling in from very far, it's just rising in a more localized spot, there's going to be less rotation. So that's why we have this tendency for, you know, dust devils when those conditions occur, uh, that they're rotating very quickly. And these are scaled down versions of, you know, mesocyclonic activity and all the way up to larger scale, you know, low pressure centers and storms. They have different characteristics. They don't typically, you know, produce any kind of cloud or not generated by clouds or anything like that. Um, they're more localized. Uh, there's a water version, right? We talk about water spouts in the ocean. Um, they're not exactly the same mechanism, but, you know, we do see that, that action taking place in other contexts. So what are we looking for specifically if we were trying to identify the likelihood of uh, dust devil taking place, right? We've already put some definition behind it. We've got a, a nice thick lower layer that's uh, pretty hot and dry. And then we have a very, very intense shallow lower layer of that planetary boundary layer. Um, we would need a lot of solar radiation coming in. So what is that? That means you don't have um, a bunch of cloud cover, no stratus clouds, right? I mean, that's going to block out that activity. And then the wind speed, if it was mixing it up and you know creating uniformity in the lower uh, layer, then you wouldn't have the condition for this uh, super adiabatic lapse rate to occur. Okay, so let's look at it on the skew T chart and see if we can kind of make sense of it. Here's my little um, simulation, right, that we can look at. Uh, you could think of it as, um, you know, planetary boundary layer, right? We're just talking about this lower convective zone that's going on. And these are usually between one and three kilometers in altitude during the daytime, and they can actually go to four and five in extreme cases. So if you would have a really, really high PPL, um, that indicates you have a lot of heating, right? Among other things. Um, the drier the planetary boundary layer, the higher the cloud bases will be. Because what does that mean? It means uh, all of this convection taking place and, you know, the top of it is uh, basically where you have neutral buoyancy, right? It's not going to, uh, you know, form clouds any lower than that. This is pretty much where it's being lifted to. So dry surface and light winds, um, again, our conditions. Uh, max temperature, mid to high 30s or, you know, 95 degrees and greater. And we get lots of those days in our, in our climate, right? We're about to get into the season. I think we've already had a few days that we're pushing 90 degrees. And we have, in fact, seen dust devils at the LZ, even though it's still March. Okay, so there is no such thing as too early uh, anymore, it seems. Uh, the convective temperature is greater than the max temperature. Um, the convective condensation level is not reached, so no clouds have formed, no convective clouds have formed. There are clouds that form in other ways, right? We're just talking about convective clouds that are being generated from surface convection. Um, if the planetary boundary layer is deep, that's hot days with weak radiation inversion, low winds, and not much mixing. So let's look at this QT chart. Now we talked about the low winds, um, the parcels, well, we have rising parcels of air, they bring down the horizontal wind momentum through their mixing, right? So think about this, like if there's a lot of bubbling going on, let's just look at the last one here, right? If there's a lot of bubbling going on here at the surface, if we have wind coming in horizontally, it's not going to make its way through that very easily, right? It's going to be slowed down by that action, whereas the air on top of the planetary boundary layer can move much more easily. It's unimpeded by this bubbling action going on at the surface. So do you see how one causes the other, right? We have low wind speeds because of the action going on, which is basically, you know, it's, it's blocking it, right? It's creating an obstacle for it as well as you have surface friction 
Okay, and then stronger winds aloft plus that thermal mixing, um, that's what's creating lower wind speed. So here on the SKU-T chart, we always have an indicator of wind speed on the side. I just drew these, right? So we would remember to talk about them. But you can see this where you have very low wind speeds at the bottom and then they increase after a certain point. And usually you're gonna see that increase after the uh, PBL or the convective zone. Let's look at the chart a little closer and we'll try to uh, plot a day where we would expect dust devils to occur. So the first is that you would have your um, environmental lapse rate plotted. And this is from the weather balloon, right? The radio sun using telemetry data. And it's just reporting back the air temperature, the ambient air temperature as you go up through the atmosphere. And something to note here, right? You have the green lines going off to the left. Remember what those are? That's the parcel temperature. So this is the cooling off of the air mass at any given temperature from the lower layer. As it moves up and expands, then that's gonna be the rate of cooling. So already we can see that there's this deviation from that if we were to compare it to this line here, right? That it's actually jogging to the left quite a bit more that's not following the curve of the dry adiabatic lapse rate. And remember what super adiabatic, the definition was that it's greater than, right? The cooling off greater than. Now think about it this way, right? We talk about cooling off, but this is actually a very hot day, right? At the surface or near the surface where this plot starts. It's that we have a very, very hot, a lower layer right here. And then it starts to, get closer to the, the curve of the dry adiabatic lapse rate as we move up through the atmosphere, right? So this lower part right here is the deviation. And then we have the dew point sounding. And right off the bat, what we can tell is what? Look at the separation of the two lines at the lower layer, it's quite extreme. What does it mean when the two lines touch? That's going to be a fully saturated air mass, potentially clouds if they're within two degrees or touching. But when they're separated, when there's a quite a big distance in between them, that's very dry air, right? We're basically saying that to get anything uh, close to saturation in this air mass, you would have to go from you know 30 something degrees all the way down to basically almost freezing <laughs> to get it to, to uh, condensate or to, uh, to saturate out, right? So that's, a, that's quite a long ways to go. And it's telling you that the air mass is very dry. As you come down, it's even drier, right? It's pretty dry on the lower layer. Here's your dry adiabatic lapse rate or your, your mean plot. Right, And it's basically mirrors this green line on either side of it, but we're just plotting from the middle. And now we can see the distance in between the plotted line here of the dry adiabatic lapse rate and the environmental lapse rate. So in between these two, especially where they're very far apart, this is the condition of unstable air, right? Very unstable air. And anytime that this red line is to the left, that is saying that the air around the parcel is now cooler than, or sorry, the, yeah, the air around the parcel is now cooler than the parcel itself. That is to say that if the parcel started at around this temperature down here, the entire way up through the atmosphere up to you know 2,200 feet or so on this chart, uh, it would be very, very unstable. There'd be lots of turbulence. There'd be lots of upward movement and it would continue moving upward until it hit a certain point up here where you have the opposite condition and now the parcel temperature is colder than the ambient temperature. So the potential to mix thermally, all this area in between here, and we also know this as CAPE on other charts, right? But um, this, is, this is your zone right here. This is your PBL up to the point where you don't really see that mixing going on as much anymore through that convective action. This is your super adiabatic condition right here at the bottom. 
And we can just say that if we see this line jogging that extreme to the left, then we can expect very, very warm lower layer with a cooler um, air mass above it, right? Remember this blue line are the thermals that are popping off and this line down here, right? It represents the cooling off of the atmosphere. Uh, here's a lack of a, of a convective uh, condensation level because you can see where the dew point line mixing ratio, right? And they start from the same plot here. These pink dashed lines are the mixing ratio and where they go up and they meet the, the uh, mean plot. This level right here, it would be the convective condensation level, but what are the condition once you get there? It's that the parcel temperature is colder than the environmental lapse rate. So you're not going to have cloud formation on this day due to convection, right? Plus you don't have any moisture in the atmosphere to facilitate that either. So that means clear blue skies, very hot lower layer, a colder layer up on top, and it's not actually cold, right? It's just cooler than the extreme heat that's coming off of the surface. And then we have a, a well-mixed uh, dew point profile. It's basically that the dew point plot is exactly in line with the mixing ratio. So this represents a, um, a well-mixed dew point profile of the PBL. So dry surface, light winds, right? We talked about that earlier. Now we can see it on the chart. Um, the strong diurnal variation in the planetary boundary layer, that's just the day and the night cycle, right? Um, shallow PBL at night and a deeper PBL during the day, right? That's basically setting up an oscillation in the weather pattern, um, the wind pattern. A PPL is deeper during the day due to surface heating and seasonal variations are more extreme in the summer months. So when the rate of the temperature decreases with height, uh, when that exceeds the adiabatic lapse rate or the ELR for a region of the atmosphere, turbulence is generated because the ELR is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate and descending parcels of air remains warmer than the surrounding ambient air. So we can see these conditions on the skew T chart. We can recognize them. We don't even need to uh, go outside of our house, right? We can start to recognize <clears throat> the probability of one of these days. Um, and then again, right, steep lapse rate is what we're talking about here, right? Steep lapse rate means that it's cooling off very quickly and again, that's not that it's cold, it's just that it's super hot at the lower layer and then uh, cooling off from that point. Uh, a large incident solar radiation angles, right? It's basically that the sun is high in the sky, so it would be more likely when you have a, um, a solar max, right? That's the, the sun is perpendicular to the ground or, or closest to it. So that's gonna be a seasonal shift, right? And also a daily thing where we have these points in the day that are going to be more extreme than others. Minimum cloudiness, sun has to reach the ground, and then low humidity, right? Because the uh, moisture will actually homogenize some of the um, heat in that air mass. Dry and barren soil, that's us, right? Lots of that. And surface winds are below a critical value and also tends to happen in high pressure systems, right? We have very low surface winds, especially towards the, the center of high pressure systems. Uh, low, I know there's a lot to read, right? Low relative humidities are also conducive to steeper lapse rates in the surface layers due to the fact that water vapor is a strong absorber and the wavelengths of terrestrial radiation, but nearly transparent in the solar radiation wavelengths. Therefore, atmospheric humidity or water vapor is very low. Um, the terrestrial radiation is passed to outer space, minimum warming of the atmosphere. With high humidity, the atmospheric vapor uh, absorbs much of the outgoing terrestrial radiation and in turn warming the atmosphere and thus reducing temperature gradient between the surface and the lower layers of the atmosphere. This is another way of saying what we said, right? And remember, we talked about the diabetic and adiabatic process. 
just a reminder here, right? When we're looking at skew T charts, that's not the be all end all. We can assume that the very lowest layer that's in contact with the ground is even hotter. And that is why we get the dust devils farming. Now, if you've seen mirages, right? Looks like puddles and, and stuff in the, in the horizon, water on the ground when it's just heat. That process right there, that's the diabatic process that you're looking at, the contact that's happening between the air and the surface. And then the air above that, right? That's not in contact with it. That is a different layer, right? So where you have the superheating going on, uh, you're definitely having more likelihood of that air wicking off and forming dust devils um, in extreme cases. What are some practical precautions that we can uh, observe or take? So, uh, number one, that uh, risk of injury from extreme anabatic flow and rotation. Obviously, you know you can't handle this kind of um, wind in a paraglider, right? It's it's hard enough if the wind is blowing like fifteen, <laughs> but um, if it's uh, enough to pull dust off the ground and rotate it to hundreds of feet in the air, then you probably don't have a chance if you're connected. And that it will be on the kiting launch and landing. So please be careful with this, right? And we've seen videos just recently in class where people are getting pulled off the launch. Okay, so it's not just that you see it at the uh, LZ. If you're on your landing approach, that's also another problem, right? Because by the time you spot one, uh, you're, you're kind of committed to that area and it's very difficult to escape once you're, once you're close enough. So here's just a seasonal plot. Um, we would expect a lot more of this activity in midsummer, but like I said, we have already seen dust devils and there's you know, a, a chance that you're going to see them even on your next visit. So for this reason, you know, we, we just don't want to be out there in the middle of the day. Even if we see other people doing it, they are taking a risk, whether they know it or not, right, of, of getting wrapped up with one of these events. Some days carry a much greater risk of dust devils and turbulent airflow near the surface. What are they again? Clear skies, low wind, super, super hot lower layer of the PBL, a thick planetary boundary layer. And, uh, you know, lots of convective action going on. And not all dust devils are visible. That was the other one. I repeated that a few times in other sessions. And just to bring it up again, right, we uh, <laughs> saw a, uh, another, um, you know, he was a P4. He was a pilot come out there last year onto the LZ and decided to do some kiting on the edge of the landing field. And um, it was about 2.30 in the afternoon. It didn't seem like a dust devil day. Uh, but he definitely got caught in one, picked up, slammed, ragdolled, and got a concussion from it all. I've known pilots to get picked up and be deposited on the side of the mountain um, through absolutely no involvement of their own. They were just passengers at that point, ended up with a broken back. And, um, you know, even if you see them, they develop very, very quickly and, uh, you know, become monstrous. Um, if somebody reminds me, I'll upload my video of the one at Saboba that grew to 500 feet in about six seconds. And, um, you know, and then some of them are invisible. That's the problem, right? I mean, we might think that we can avoid these just by having situational awareness, but it's not always the case. Prior events indicate ongoing conditions most of the time, right? Unless you just happen to see the very last dust devil of the day. You can assume that if there are ones that have already been observed, then you need to use caution. And one of the ways that you can figure this out before you get connected to any gear or go up to launch is you could just ask people that have been there at your air park, right? That's one of the cool things about going to an established air park is there's other pilots, other people who have been there, and you can simply ask them, how is the day going? And I guarantee like 99% of all pilots, the first thing they will say is that we just saw a dust devil like 20 minutes ago, right? That's, that's one of the things they're going to say. <laughs> they're not going to be like, oh, everything's gravy, right? They're going to tell you the worst case scenario, which is that they just saw the most extreme condition take place. Um, waiting for surface temps to decrease 
How do we do that? We just wait longer in the day, right? We're looking for de-escalating conditions. Do we see dust devils at sunset? No, we don't, right? That's just not a thing. And so we know that if we just kind of chill out a little more, um, then we reduce our risk. Now, that is to say, you know, it's not like dust devils shut off at 345, right? I mean, they could continue on. It just depends on the season, how long the day, right? How much solar heating and all that other stuff we just talked about. But, um, you know, that is one of the ways that we can minimize our risk is just by flying later in the day. Okay. Uh, flying in the part of the day with max temperature is risky. And, and what is the max temperature, right? It's, um, you know, right around two o'clock for most of the time, most of the, the summer months. Um, it takes a little while for that max temperature to be reached. The lower unstable layers and low altitude are formula for disaster. So if it's unstable um, in the lower layers and you are at low altitude, that is launch, landing, or otherwise, um, that's the formula for disaster right there, right? I mean, if you were going to be in the air and it was like these conditions, uh, it would probably be better to be much higher. <laughs> and that's where you get people's, you know, if they fly all day, if they do cross country, um, the idea is to be high and away from terrain during these conditions. And, you know, if you're high enough and, you know, you're at the top of the PBL, you see dust devils, then it's not even a thing, right? That doesn't, that doesn't really affect you that much. You might feel it as lift, right? You might even get some uh, good airtime out of it if you were high enough, but it's at the lower layers uh, that prove the most risky. Uh, there's risk of injury just by being on the ground connected to a glider. I can't emphasize that enough, right? If you are just connected to one, and this includes kiting in the LZ. The last three hours of daylight is usually, not always, but usually a better time to avoid these conditions. And that's why that's when our class starts, right? Like imagine if I had even a one hour earlier start time, we would probably have quite a few pilots that got wrapped up in nasty stuff coming off the LZ, considering that these happen about 20% of the time in the middle of the day, right? And until we know like for a fact when these conditions are to occur, then it's better just to err on the side of caution and uh, don't get out there. There are days, especially in the winter, where you could kite in the middle of the day and be fine. Right, but we are not in that season any longer. We're moving into the season where we could have these dust devil events. Now, we talked a lot about very, very hot lower layers, um, but I just want to bring up one more point. And you could, um, you could have a warm lower layer, right? This is all relative. You could have a warm lower layer, and then you could have cold air on top of that from like advection or some other mechanism. And you could also have that condition being met where you have an extreme case of um, convective rigorous convection at the surface because you have a very high temperature gradient and a short amount of altitude, a, sm a very uh, small amount of altitude. Okay, guys, uh, hopefully I hammered that in enough. What's the uh, takeaway? Uh, don't go out there and screw around the middle of the, the, the daytime with your gear, um, in the middle of summer for th those pilots that live in Arizona and in New Mexico still applies, right? If you're in a desert climate, these are, um, a bit more, uh, prominent features. You're not going to find these, uh, happening in jungles and stuff, right? This is in the arid South. Wow. You made it this far, then you might have the patience that it takes to be a true canopy pilot. Our course is a mixture of Zoom presentations, these types of sessions, 3D modeling, and whiteboards. Like I said earlier, if you want to see more of this type of content, then head over to our website, join the classes today, and I'll see you online.